Good evening. It's five o'clock, time to begin. I'd like to welcome everyone to the five o'clock service of the Burning Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, we invite you to come back at every opportunity that you have. And uh, <clears throat> you're an honored guest, we appreciate you being here. Our first song tonight will be number 518. 518. We'll see the first and last verses. <clears throat> Though I through the valley of shadow, or mountain, or trouble see, and off in the darkness have traveled, the Lord has been mindful of me. The Lord has been mindful of me. He blesses and blesses again. My God is the God of Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity you've given for us to come out and study and learn more about your word. We thank you for the opportunities you give us each and every day to be out in the community and hopefully be the example you'll have us be. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that we take the things that we've learned here today and we'll learn and help apply them to our lives. Pray that you'll be with those that are sick, those who have lost loved ones. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you just continue to be with us each and every day. And as we fall short, pray that we're thankful that you will continue to forgive us when we sin. And please do that. For it's in your Son, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Song of encouragement will be number 516. 516. Now turn to 528. 
last verses of this song. <clears throat> Let us see. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The Tonight we're going to do part two of what we started this morning. And, and for those who weren't here this morning, I give you a quick review of what we talked about. Looked at a, a website where a man, a social media post, this or that, and he asked the question, uh, my father was on his deathbed, and I called an individual over and he sprinkled him. Will God accept that? And I read some about 10 or 12 different posts when he asked that question, he got responses from different individuals. And all those that I showed this morning, they all said, yes, that'd be great. You know, we shouldn't be legalistic. Therefore, you know, there's exceptions to every rule, and, and that's what they were saying. And then the point, the, the kicker about it was, all those responses to this individual were that of gospel preachers, preachers in the church, and how they were saying it's a great thing that he was sprinkled and how they're completely overlooking that immersion and baptism and, and, uh, and how the man that did the sprinkling was a deacon in the church and some were, one was concerned, well, they're going to maybe kick him out and such as for doing that. And, and that, that was the, what we looked at this morning. Uh, what we're going to look at tonight is how, how do they come up with that reasoning? How do individuals come up with that reasoning that it's okay, there are exceptions to the word rule, and amazing, we may think about this, they use scripture to come up with this. Now, just because they use scripture doesn't mean it's right, but they do use scripture trying to justify the reasoning that there are exceptions to the rule, that one could be sprinkled or poured or immersed. You know, just look at the circumstance and let the situation determine what needs to be done. Well, here's part of their, I think we'll look at several uh, tonight, not several, four or five, to show how they reason this out. Number one, was David, why was David not stoned for committing adultery? And again, we know the story. David committed adultery with Bathsheba and everything that went on with that. And the law said that if that happened, you were to stone the individual. And sure enough, Leviticus 20 verse 10 says, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he commits adultery with his neighbor's wife. The adulterer and the adulteress shall be shall surely be put to death. Well, they would say, well, David wasn't put to death. He was the exception to the rule here. For whatever reason, God decided he would let him pass on this. So therefore, we can't say that every law that, that given in the Old Testament was kept perfectly. And that's what they would say about this. So they would say that the man who was sprinkled, he's an exception to the rule. God made an exception for David here. 
He did not have David stoned, so therefore it's okay for what this individual did for being sprinkled. Well, that's one view how they'll use it to justify uh, this exception rule. Another, they dab in the bayou. Leviticus 10.1 then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and put incense on it and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So here are two sons of Aaron. They offered strange fire. They did not get the fire from where they were supposed to when it came to lighting these censers. The fire was to come from the original, the altar that they had there. The fire that whenever Aaron first lit that altar there in the in, in beginnings of the worship, that fire had continually been burning continually for all those years. And here Nadab and Abihu were to get fire from that altar. But they got it from somewhere else. And it angered the Lord, and the Lord struck Nadab and Abihu dead because of what they did, or they were destroyed by the fire here. So you have the family that's in mourning. Aaron, he's just lost two sons. That same day, his two other sons do something as well that's wrong. Eleazar and Ithamar, in verse 16 through 18. Then Moses made careful inquiry about the goat of the sin offering. And there it was burned up. And he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, who were left saying, Why have you not eaten the sin offering in a holy place? And said, It's the most holy. And God has given it to you uh, to bear the guilt of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord. See, its blood was not brought inside the holy place. Indeed, you should have eaten it in the holy place as I commanded. So they bring this Eleazar Ithamar, bring this sin offering in, they cook it, and it was to be eaten by the priest. But they didn't eat of it. And here Moses is asking them, why didn't you do this? And here we have maybe Aaron, who overhears this, Eleazar, Ithamar, and they're maybe thinking, oh no, we're fixing to die ourselves. Here we are, we have disobeyed God, just like Nadab and Abihu did. They disobeyed God, and God Brought, struck him dead with a fire, you might say. What's going to happen to us? And here we have maybe Aaron who is thinking, I don't want two more sons to die today. Two in one day is enough. What's going to happen? Well, here's what happens in verse 19. And Aaron said to Moses, Look, this day they have offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord, and such things have befallen me. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? So when Moses heard that, he was content. Aaron speaks to Moses. I'm in a state of grief. I have lost two sons today, and my heart is not in it. And if I had eaten of this offering, well, I don't think it would have been accepted, accepted because my heart wasn't right. And you can understand, here's a father, lost two sons, instantly, you might say, and, and now his thinking is, what about my other two sons? Well, he tells Moses, here's what's going on, and, and Moses makes an exception to the rule. Moses lets the, the sons spare their lives, or whatever the punishment would have been, and therefore you have those today who will use Ele, uh, Eleazar and Ithamar and say, here's another example of exception to the rule. Another example why you got to look at the situation. It may be that sprinkling is okay, or it may be that pouring is okay, or it may be immersion will work. It doesn't really matter. The situation determines what's going to happen. And they will use that. Another example of what they will use. A third example that they will use, David and the showbread. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. David is running from King Saul, and he's, and he's hungry. He has some men with him, and they have nothing to eat. And they go to Ahimelech, the priest, and at least David does. And he goes to Ahimelech, and he says to him, uh, we're starving to death. We need something to eat. And Ahimelech says, <clears throat> all we have here 
is the showbread, and it's only for the priest. You can't have this. Only the priests are, are to eat this, and it's not for you to eat. And then David says, he tells a lie here. He says to Ahimelech, well, I'm on business on, for King Saul, and I can't tell you what it is. It's a secret mission, but we need something to eat in order for me to continue doing what the king has sent me to do. And Ahimelech, he gives him the showbread, and David takes it back, and he eats it, and the man eat it as well. But well, why didn't God strike David dead, dead here as well? Because David was doing that which he was not permitted to do. Why didn't God strike dead Ahimelech? Because he knew it was only the priest that was to eat this. So there, there, there they will say, here you have again exception to the rule. David was hungry, needed something to eat. It's just bread. It was older bread. And they're probably just going to throw it out or whatever, but exception to the rule that God let David pass, let Ahimelech pass because of this. And then they will go, also go to Matthew chapter 12 where Christ brings this up. And at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest. Well, they will say, Well, here Christ brings this up. And he's showing that it was okay for David to go in, in there and eat this bread. It was okay for him to do it. That was the exception to the rule. And even Christ is agreeing with that. But Christ isn't agreeing with what David did. He's confronting the, these Pharisees here who were looking at his disciples, going through the grain fields, pulling this grain with their hands and eating it, and they were saying, your disciples are working. They shouldn't be doing this on the Sabbath. But they weren't breaking any law. You had to have some kind of tool out to be cutting the, the harvest or the wheat or whatever they were eating for it to be work. Nothing wrong with getting this with your hands and eating it. And what David was showing here to, I mean what Christ is showing here to the Pharisees, their inconsistency. Because here they are, they're not condemning David. And he did that which was wrong. Instead, they're condemning the disciples for eating and they're doing nothing wrong. And Christ is pointing that out to them and by no means is Christ trying to show that uh, David was in the right. David was okay. He was the exception. He wasn't doing that. He was showing the Pharisees their error and how they were misjudging the, the, the disciples. Another they will use, the woman caught in adultery, John chapter 8. Woman's caught in adultery. And they bring, him before, bring her before Christ. He writes in the sand. They're ready to stone this woman. And he says to those that are standing there, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. Well, no one casts any stone. They drop them and they leave. And Christ goes to this woman and says, no, where are your accusers? And that word in 811, she says, said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Well, according to the law, was this woman not to be stoned? Well, yes, if you read the law and understood the law, it had to be done in the right way. Number one, where was the man? He wasn't there uh, for the, the one who committed adultery with her. Both were to be stoned. Then we might ask, uh, where were the witnesses? You had to have two or more witnesses to witness this. They were not there. And then you might ask a question about the witnesses. They were the ones who were to cast the first stone if this, if this was going to take place. So the reason Christ didn't allow this to happen, they weren't going by the law. They were taking the law, breaking the law, and yet some would want us to believe that, well, this exception to the rule. Christ looked at this woman and said, it's okay, go on about your way, don't do it anymore. No, it's, it was not the exception to the rule. They were not keeping the law uh, that they were 
trying to carry out on this woman. That's how they take the scriptures and they will twist them to make it seem like Christ taught exceptions. And there are Bibles full of exceptions. No, it's not. Well, how do we answer this? Well, there are two verses, I think, that give us a good understanding of this. Acts 17 and verse 30 and Acts 14 16. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Then verse 16, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. There was a time when God did overlook the ignorance of man in the Old Testament. He did. Even when it came to the nations and how they would operate, he let them walk in their own ways. But now, in the New Testament, since the cross, since the death of Christ, God doesn't allow that anymore. He looked at this, and as some versions will say, like in verse 17, 30, he would wink at it. Well, God doesn't wink at it anymore. Uh, God doesn't look at this as being an exception. And why? Why no more exceptions to the rule since the cross? Well, we're not told why. But... I think, I would say, if I had to give a comment on it, look at the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, you had bulls and goats and, and doves and animals that were sacrificed. Those were animals. But you come to the New Testament, and we have the ultimate sacrifice, the very Son of God who came down from heaven to live among us a perfect life, and look how we treated him. We, we killed him. And God's not going to let that just pass with some kind of exception. Again, Christ came to this earth to do what he did, and he, it pleased God that he did this. It pleased God that he would leave heaven to begin with and that he would give his life for those that hated him, those that hated him, ones that put him to death. He'd give his life for those and for us as well. And because of the, his son, there are no more exceptions. There was a time when he would overlook this, when he overlooked David, when he overlooked, overlooked uh, Eleazar, Ithamar, when he overlooked David again with the showbread. There was a time, the adulterous woman, a time when all that he would do, but not anymore. Look at the sacrifice. Look at what it cost God for this to take place. Ephesians 5, 2, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. It pleased God for Christ to do this. It a sweet-smelling aroma. For God, for to see Christ that would obey God the way he did, and to love us as much as he did, that was very pleasing to God. And, and that's why there's no more exceptions. No more. So, just because God was lenient to some in the Old Testament, can we tell others today that God will be lenient towards them? We can't do that. We don't have the example of that. Instead, of what we have to do, what we must do, is 1 Peter 4.11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If we start speculating, and we have clear understanding of what God has said, and we start saying, well, I think it doesn't make any difference. I think sprinkling will be okay. I think pouring will be okay. When God is specific in showing us by command and by example, well, we can't do that. We've got to let the Lord speak in his word and let it speak for us. And again, Romans 4, verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Again, that's what we got to do. Our culture is trying to tell us, and even religion as a whole is trying to tell us we don't need to live by the rules of the Bible. Oh, it's a good book, but it's out of date. It's so out of date. It doesn't understand what we're living with today, what we're going through. Well, again, the Bible is not out of date. It will never be out of date, just as Christ is never out of date. And we're going to be judged by that word, his word, one day. That's why we got to make sure that we teach the word as God has laid out. If we do what he says it, then we have nothing to worry about as far as it coming back on us. And God saying, why did you change it? We don't want that to be on our shoulders. Why did we change? 
If you're not a Christian tonight, the Bible's still the same. What must I do to be saved? Again, we believe with our heart that we are to repent of our sins, confess the great name of Christ, be baptized for forgiveness of our sins, and, and live a faithful life thereafter. And when time comes for stand before God, we give an account, Lord, I live faithful. I did my best. I taught it the way you said to teach it. And then we have nothing to worry about on that day. If you need to become a Christian, do so tonight. Or as one just needs prayers of any way, get a good time to do that as well as we stand and sing our invitation.